Thor Eddie Hall fight. Well, I guess Eddie Hall pulled out, so it's Pujanowski. Are you following any of that? I didn't know anything about that. Yeah, you you know the guy. I think he's um he was in Game of Thrones. You know the giant guy, and I think he's yeah. the strongest man in the world. Thor half Thor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I so he say that again. I know who you're talking about. Okay, so he's fighting Eddie Hall in Florida. Uh, I think next month, or maybe it's this month. No, it's not in September. And so I had a guy who was on the undercard doing the uh, on the show, and uh, he was parked in front of a strip club. He was using their Wi-Fi. I mean, you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Where are you at? What what state are you in? Uh, so I'm in Overland Park, Kansas. Wow, and that's where this that's where this guy was too. He was in Kansas. <laughs> Jacob Hepner. Wonder what strip club he was at. <laughs> uh, someone told me too, because afterwards someone in the comments goes, "Oh, I drive by that strip club every day. It's a complete shithole." What's it called? Remember? I don't know. I honestly, I don't, I don't remember. I think it started with a W. Whitey's or Whitney's or uh, Whispers. Whispers. Yes. Yes. That's uh, yeah. That is. I've never been to that one, but I heard it's <laughs> out in the middle of nowhere, and from what I heard, it's a, it's a shithole. <sighs> Oh, I wish, I wish I knew Kansas better. So I, if I knew you guys were close to each other, <laughs> are you born and raised in Kansas? Uh, so I was born and raised in uh, Kansas City, Missouri, which is Parker back to back. So they're not far. Okay. From okay. Damn. You're breaking up a little bit. I want, I wonder if people hear you breaking up in on, uh, on the live feed. Hope not. Um, and uh, so you're born and raised there, and, that, and that's where you lived your whole life, Kansas? Uh, so I lived in Missouri most of my life. Uh, kind of, I live about 45 minutes north of where I am now. And then I met my wife, and we just keep moving further and further south away from my family. So, yeah, I live in Overland Park, Kansas now. Uh, nice area. So, yeah, I haven't lived here my whole life, just a couple years. Was that the plan, to move away from the family? Uh, no, not really. <laughs> My wife grew up in uh, Overland Park, Kansas. She grew up in Leewood around here. Uh, so I just moved closer with her, her family. Is, Cause I'm a nice guy. Yeah. And you're going to want it. I know I, um, in some of the interviews I've seen you do, you've talked about having kids and you're going to want to be close to your parents. I mean, they're, they're 35 minutes away, so it's really not too far, but you know, her parents are, you know, 10 minutes away tops. Most of her family is 10 minutes away. Uh, I think my family was, thinking about getting a house a little bit closer to us. We haven't talked about that yet, though. How old are you? Uh, 34. And uh, you fight in the 170-pound division in the UFC. Yep, welterweight. Yes, I do. And you've made it to the highest level on planet Earth in the fight game. Uh, I mean, the UFC belt's the highest level, so once we get there, we'll, we'll talk about that. Congratulations. How exciting. Yeah. It's been a long road, man. I'm I'm a I'm a veteran of the sport. Uh, I've been in it for you know 13, 14 years. Had a lot of ups and downs. It's been a, it's been a rough road to get here, but you know, when uh, when you get your hand raised in the UFC cage, it, it makes it makes it all worth it. And you've never lost two fights in a row. Yeah, that's that's a weird one. I don't know how that happened. And you have some great fight win streaks. Yeah, that's that's kind of part of the ups and downs. I would get on a five fight win streak, think I was close to UFC, and lose a fight, and then I'd get. You know, four fights in a row and lose a fight. It's just the way, the way the way it works. I don't know why it happened, but you know, everything happens for a reason. And when you say you you think you you are getting close to getting into the UFC, what do you mean? Like you start to hear whispers, or your manager tells you, "Hey, I got a call with the UFC." What 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 signs do you get that you might be close? I mean, your the UFC always looks for win streaks. They always want winners. You know, I mean, you don't get anywhere in this game being a loser. It's not the way it works. Um, and so you know. I'd get five fights going, and there'd be a lot of people talking about me being in the UFC. Like, I should have been in the UFC this time, this time, yada, yada, yada. And, you know, honestly, I, like, I think I think timing is everything. I think everything happens for a reason. And the way I got in the UFC and how I got in the UFC is, is just perfect, the way the story plays out. Um, and um, what was the first sport you played as a kid? How did, how, how did you – what started your, like, your journey of, like, using your body and enjoying moving around? Yeah, so I was uh, I was born really really naturally athletic, and, and that's that's played a, a big factor in most of my life. Uh, I played football and, and baseball when I was younger, and I really enjoyed it. And I wish I would have stuck with football 
um, when I was younger, because I, I think I could have gone to college and played um, and stuff like that. But uh, I went from I went from baseball and football to skateboarding, uh, which which I absolutely love skateboarding. Like I still watch skate videos this day. My Instagram's with skateboarding. Uh, it's something that that if I didn't fight, I would still do. I'll still skateboard. I still roll around on it every once in a while. But there's no point, in, um, especially where I'm at now. So skateboarding and football and baseball were kind of where I was before, before I started fighting. Did you wear wrist guards? No. <laughs> if you get on a... I threw myself down handrails. I threw myself downstairs. I mean, I, I battered my body, and then, then I started fighting. So when I'm about 50, 60, I'm going to be I'm gonna be in a lot of trouble. My body's going to be feeling a little bit older than I want it to be. And what was the first sort of combat sport I'm get, that you ever did? Did you start wrestling in high school or something? How did you start that? No, I uh, I started mixed martial arts. <laughs> uh, just kind of all played out together. My uncle used to be a kickboxer and boxer, and I started training with him one day. My neighbors across the street were doing strength conditioning, and I started doing that with them. And they they handed me off to a, a mixed martial arts gym uh, about thirty minutes away from the house, and I just kind of all that kind of fell into play of, of how I got into mixed martial arts. I always wanted to fight. I always wanted to, and I don't mean like in a violent way. I didn't hurt anybody, but but to uh, just compete is what I really enjoy doing. And that's just that, that fell into place. How old, how old were you? Like when you first started MMA? 21, 22. So around there. I was a old, little, old, little older than I should have been. Were you comfortable right away with all the contact? Like with like, just like rolling around with guys and like, and the reason why I ask is, so I took my three year old, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I got you. Okay. So I took my three-year-old to, um, his first jujitsu class in Santa Cruz, California, Garth Taylor jujitsu. He started crying. I waited a year. I took him back at four and for the first three months, three days a week, um, he would only do the warm up, and then I would make him just sit and then he would want to get off the map, but I would just make him sit on the map, and I would ask him, Hey, why don't you want to do any of the technique? And he's only four. And he said, cause I don't want strangers touching me. And I'm thinking to myself and I don't do it. Right. So I don't do it. And I'm thinking, yeah, I wouldn't want strangers touching me either. There's a guy with his knee on your cock and balls. There's a guy with his hand on your face. You're rolling around with other people. And there's a lot of strange men in there, right? Like he's four and there's and his, all his teachers are, you know, like 15 to 50. Right. And, uh, and then finally one day, Garth Taylor, the guy um, who runs the, the gym, the center, walked up to Avi and said, hey, did you know Batman does jujitsu? And that was it. And yeah, since then, mind. yeah, since then he's been doing, mar I have three boys now. I have uh, two four-year-olds and a six-year-old. They've been doing martial arts five days a week for, uh, I don't know, two, three years. But I, uh, but I, but I do think about that. It's a crazy intimate sport. You know, I mean, I've heard people say about the UFC, it's really just really shitty gay porn. And, uh, did that just come naturally to you to just be okay with that much physical contact? My first question to those people is, are they watching like really high quality gay porn? Like, <laughs> no, that's, that is a good question. I'll start asking that. That'll be my rebuttal. <laughs> gay porn, what are they watching? Like do they pay for a monthly subscription or what? I uh, think they're making fun of me because they know I'm addicted. I watch zero TV except on Saturdays. I block off every Saturday and, uh, your boy, got to watch some TV. Yeah. Every Saturday I just block it off and just watch UFC as much as I can. Yeah, um, man, I was I was comfortable. With it. I don't know, like I never looked at it as 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 uh, like gay porn, and never looked at it like that. Uh, I just enjoyed the competition of. I like I, I hate team sports. Like it, it, it drives me crazy because I'm one of those people that I will give a hundred percent. If we're playing flag football, we're playing, you know, uh, badminton. I don't care. I'm giving a hundred percent as much as I can. If somebody else is giving fifty percent, we lose. Like it's like I don't I don't like that factor that that I can lose because somebody else isn't trying. I don't like that. I don't like that in, in sports. So for me, mixed martial arts was like the ultimate form of competition. It still is. Like it's it's you versus you. It's you versus other guy. There's only one outcome. Now you you have a team that you put in a lot of work with, but at the same time you only have you and you to to go into that cage with. And, and I really enjoyed that factor. I never thought about it as as super intimate. I just I just rolled and, and enjoyed. Enjoying the competition of uh, beating other people and, and other people beating me, unfortunately, that way. But, you know. Uh, um, it, it's, it's interesting you say that. So basically, um, at, a, at a, I don't know, around 20 years old, I started making videos and films. I'm 49 now. 
and I had three partners and throughout the years and they were all amazing partners, but they compartmentalized their life. They would take vacations. They would take Saturdays and Sundays off. And I always, and now I'm out on my own and it's so much better because I just want to work. And I, the team sport thing wasn't for me either. Like, and I start to resent people who are on the team who are like only giving 95% and it's not fair to them. It's not fair to them. It's not fair to me. And so it's like, finally, I'm like, okay, fuck it. It's just, it's, it's, I'm just going to do this on my own. And, and hence I have this podcast, but it is scary as shit. I mean, yeah, but, but the, the risk reward for that, you know, is, is anything like the higher the risk, the, the higher the reward. So and if you're not facing your fears, then you're not growing, right? You're not doing shit. When did you know you were tough? Like, like in my mind, I can't be punched in the face. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm just not smart enough to realize that. You're very smart. I watched all your interviews. You're very smart. You've carried a lot of podcasts and a lot of interviewers. They should all be thankful when they interview someone like you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, to be honest with you, this is something I was uncomfortable with when I first started doing it. I, I was really nervous. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to talk to people. I still find myself talking way too fast. Like I got to like slow myself down a little bit, talk a little bit. Um, but I, I think I've always been tough, man. Even from a little kid, I would throw myself off bike ramps. I would, you know, I was skateboarding when I was a little kid. I just, I was always tough. I never, that was just kind of the, the way I was built. It was just who I was. It was never really uh Oh, I found out this, or I did this, and maybe this way. It was just, uh, just kind of naturally who I am. My, I think, I think that's that's kind of a genetic thing for my, my whole family. My, like I said, my uncle was a professional kickboxer and boxer. My 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 biological father is a uh, like old school biker. Like looks like ZZ Top, like notorious bar fighter. Just <laughs> you know, what I mean. So we've we've all kind of just been. We were just built tough. Uh, do you have siblings? I don't. I'm an only child. Wow. I was expecting, yeah, you had three brothers and you were the youngest and you were just always getting your ass beat. I would have liked that. That sounds fantastic. <laughs> I would be a lot better at fighting if, if uh, that was the case. <laughs> um, what was your first What was your first job? I worked at a place called The Big Chill. It was a restaurant. I was just a, a, a front line, you know, just helped out the servers, get their food ready, stuff like that. Man, I was I was an immature, dumb little kid. I rode my bike to work. The bank was next door, so I could just cash my checks. Uh, not much of a job, not much of an employee, but you know, just did what I could do. Did you work hard? Did you take? Did you like pride yourself on like carrying the most plates? Like, do you, do you see any connection that like you wanted to be the best at that? You want to be the best at the UFC? Do you see any thread of continuity there? At that time, no, man. Like, I I I changed quite a bit when I turned about eighteen, nineteen. Uh, I really saw, and then. Like I saw a growth from like 18 to 19 and I saw a growth from like, like 23, 24. Like that was when I really just kind of figured out who I was. 18, 19, I was still trying to figure out as, as a, as a man who I was. Um, and I just started lifting weights when I was like 19 years old and I started fighting when I was about 21, 22. So like all those kind of just played to, to, to who I was, uh, as a person and just kind of played out a little bit. What's the, um, what's the catalyst to finding out who you are? As a young man, what starts that journey? What happened? That's a great question. Um, I think it's it's. I mean, it was what we talked about earlier. It's it's finding growth and it's putting yourself in uncomfortable positions to kind of understand who you are. You know what I mean? And, and, and fighting and fighting helped me out that out a lot. Like it, it created discipline for me. It created structure. It created a, an outlet to get a lot of energy out. It created uh, competition. To, to understand who I was, it really, I think fighting really, really just changed that. Cause I, I was drinking a lot and I was partying a lot when I was like 19, 20, 21, somewhere around there. And then I started fighting. I was like, man, I don't want to be hung over. I know the, the train. And it really like, I don't drink a lot now. It just really transitioned into, into, I wanted, it, it gave me something more that I wasn't getting out of life. And I think that really just, just transitioned a lot for, for, for my self growth. I think it's just put yourself in situations that you, you physically and mentally have to grow. And, and then I think that's, 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 that's forever changing. You know what I mean? Like, like year after year, I learn a little bit more about myself. I figure out something, I talk to somebody and, and they give me an insight that helps me fix this part of my life or grow in this part of my life. And you know what I mean? I've had a lot of influential people in my life that have really helped me kind of grow uh, mentally and, and, and 
especially in the sport and outside the sport. Are you familiar with – Even if it's a negative, even if it's a person that tells me I can't do something or tells me I shouldn't do this, it, it, it makes me be better at it. Right. Um, have you heard of CrossFit? Do you know, are you familiar with that methodology? Yeah. So, uh, a lot of my friends own CrossFit gyms. I've done CrossFit for a long time. Uh, I'm, I was actually, no shit. Well, I'm also, I also own a gym. I'm also a personal trainer. So I do a lot of personal training stuff like that. So, so I really love CrossFit. I think it's a fantastic, uh, culture in itself. Um, but, but yeah, so I'm, I'm aware of a lot of, I have a lot of people that are, that are uh, into CrossFit. And what's the name of your gym? My gym is called Fit House KC. Uh, it's just a personal training studio in Overland Park, Kansas. Why do you call it Fit House KC? If it's in Overland Park, because uh, KC is a bigger city. It gets more people. Um, people are gonna kind of Google Fit House. They're gonna get more more results. Um, and I plan on opening multiple gyms, not just in Overland Park. I thought maybe it was an ex girlfriend or something, and like you just got stuck with the name. There's no way. <laughs> when a gym after an accident. Not, not ashamed. No, I'll be divorced. <sighs> I asked because at 34 years old, I found CrossFit. And when I found CrossFit, I smoked. I smoked cigarettes. I smoked like uh, American spirits and I smoked cloves. Can you hear me? Yeah, I got you. Um, and so after doing CrossFit for like six months, I realized, hey, what do I like more, smoking cigarettes or CrossFit? Because the two were just not working together. And I just quit smoking. I was like, hey, this fucking sucks. This is ridiculous to finish a workout. Um, and then just go light up a cigarette. I could only imagine like my lungs were probably all wide open. My capillaries were firing. And then here I am puffing on a cigarette. It was stupid. Yeah, so I, I made the choice to quit. Yeah, but that, that gave you the growth you needed to get past something that most people. Uh, I, I argue with my mom every day. My mom's a smoker. 40 years, some some around there. And and I asked her today, I was like, she won't quit smoking. I was like. Just, we, we argue about it all the time. I, I literally hide her cigarettes. I break her packs of cigarettes. She's pissed off me all the time. Uh, and I was like, I was like, look. And I, I gave her the thing. I was like, would you, would you jump in front of a bullet for me? She goes, yeah, of course. Like, you would die for me. She's like, yeah, I would die for you. I'm like, cool. How about you stop smoking and live for me instead of you know, not working out, smoking, not taking care of yourself. Like those, those things really. The I get in arguments with my mom a lot about about smoking cigarettes, and I just think it's I think it's ridiculous. Man, you're a good son. Um, as a as a young man, I was probably 20 years old, and I and I was having a discussion with my dad, and I said to him, "I just want to find something that I that I would die for." And my dad paused, and he goes, "Why don't you find something that you want to live for?" And I was like, "Who, who? He fucked me up." Quick. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um. One of the greatest gifts we can give um, or one of the greatest gifts a parent can give their kids is um, taking care of their health. Right. So like one of the greatest things that I'm so happy about is that my parents are healthy and that they're financially sound, that they set themselves up in a way that like I'm not worried about them. Because if your parents are unhealthy, like it, it, it stresses you out. Right. And if they're not financially sound, it stresses you out. Well, especially, especially the person like me who I'm, I'm a pretty healthy person. I eat pretty healthy. Take care of my body. Um, my mom was sitting with her sister, who's a nurse, and they're they're both kind of overweight. They don't exercise, they don't take care of themselves, but they're complaining about their mom, who has diabetes, who's who's struggling. You know, their their dad's been smoker for how many years? They're they're complaining about these people, their parents that don't take care of themselves when they themselves don't take care of themselves in front of the person that takes care of themselves. Like, like the irony of that whole conversation was just it, it killed me. I did I didn't understand it. I, didn't, you know, I mean, it's just. You're just sitting there like you guys are literally complaining about the exact same thing you're doing in a worse way. So. Uh, it, it, is a, it is a difficult time now for people like us who take care of ourselves to see a whole world that's like, you know, feeling threatened by this virus when the leading correlate of all deaths is being obese and people are concerned about their health and yet they're shoving Coca-Cola and Twinkies in their mouth. It is We are in a very, very bizarre situation right now. I find it so weird that I'm an unhealthy, like I'm not vaccinated. My wife and I are traveling to kids. We didn't really, there, there's no evidence or science behind showing what, what the, the vaccine does for infertility. So we didn't, we didn't mess with that part. Um, but like, like you're very I, smart. That crazy that, that I'm an unhealthy person now compared to somebody who's vaccinated, who's, you know, 50% body fat. Like, I, I think that's, I think that's insane. Yes, it is. Uh, it's very backwards. And from the, 
from what I've read and I've read significantly about the vaccine, they skipped the tests and the protocol that checks on um, the effects that the vaccine has on on pregnant mice or whatever they tested them on ferrets or rabbits. They skipped that part. That was one of the shortcuts they took to get the vaccine out quicker. And so uh, not, you're white. I'm not, that. I'm not, that's just not, it's not going to happen. Right. It, you're, you, that matter. You know what I mean? Like my wife gets a vaccine and my kid has some issues because of it, because they rush it out. Like that just, you know, I mean, I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I'm not a like, like me neither. If you want to get, if you want to get a vaccine that makes you feel better, that helps you. That's great. But for me and my, my wife, especially, you know what I mean? Like I'll take the vaccine if I have to, because you know, I, I'm going to die one day anyway. So nobody gives a shit. But my wife, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, put my wife through that. Um, d- does your wife train? She looks like she's in great shape. So we met at an MMA gym. Uh, you know, the, the way we met was we'd known each other for a little bit. We'd seen each other at the gym a couple of times. And she asked me one day, she's like, I was training for a fight. And she's like, hey, do you want to be my sparring partner? I'm like, sure. And she's thinking I'm going to go light on her, which, which I did. I, I promise you I did. The first punch I threw was a Superman punch, and I cracked her. <laughs> then on, we were we, – she got so pissed off and tried to fight me. And then, you know, we just started talking after, after the class, and that's kind of how we met. Um, we call it love of first punch. You know, it works. Uh, so she does, she does orange theory. She works out quite a bit. She stays pretty healthy. Um, so yeah. Uh, so was that her, did she, did she find you attractive and cute? Is that why she asked you to spar? Like, was that her first opening line or was, did she really just look uh, for, looking for a sparring partner? Nah, depending on she found me attractive. I don't know what's wrong with her. <laughs> So, so you, you, you said you played football and baseball and you skateboarded. Um, and, and another interesting thing, and I didn't know this about you until I started digging around is I did see you, you've made some posts about skateboarding and, um, my son has now skateboarded like 400 consecutive days in a row. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, he's six years old. Um, he just saw a skateboard sitting in our entryway. I never skated, but I bought a skateboard for him and he ignored it from three to five. And then he, one day he said, Hey, I'm going to skate every day. And he's skated every day now. And at six years old, he's just a complete shredder. It's nuts. I love it. That's fantastic. And I think that mix with the jujitsu has given him a lot of confidence be, um, with falling. So when I see him crash on a skateboard, I see him do all sorts of rolls and just crazy shit. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you're going to get comfortable with falling over on skateboarding no matter what. And, you know, jujitsu, you get comfortable with take, getting taken down. I think that's something that you asked, you know, if I was always tough, but, you know, I threw myself downstairs, so I know I'm not made of glass. Right. Um, do you switch? Do you uh, skate regular foot or goofy foot or both? Uh, I'm goofy footed. Um, I, I, like I said, I, I, get, I used to be able to skate switch, but I'm not that great at it now. So I just, you know, the less falling over I can do now, the better. So I try to just stay away from that. Are you left handed? No, right hand. But you're left footed. Wow, that's a trip. That's same with my son too. Yeah, I don't understand why. It's just uh, when I jump on a skateboard, that's the way it was. And uh, when you fight, do you fight both southpaw and regular? I do fight both now. Yeah, I can switch. Uh, we call it bystantial. <laughs> <laughs> do they do they make you do that? Is that like? Is there anyone in the UFC who doesn't do that? Who can't do that? Uh, I imagine, but I think the way the sport's going right now, that you have to be able to understand that you got to be able to do both. You know I mean, you the the way the sports evolving, the the way you know, I mean, the, the sports evolving quite a bit in the past couple of months or just past year, especially. Um, you know, guys like T.J. Dillashaw with their movement switching stances, throwing from both stances. Uh, Got Jeff Jeff Molina is in our gym. He's fantastic at it. Cross is fantastic at it. Uh, so yeah, you kind of just got to evolve your game to to understand how to how to how to win in this sport. So you start MMA at 21. When does the spark come that you're like, okay, I could, I could try, I'm going to try to take this to the highest level. I'm going to try to get in the NFL. I'm going to try to get in the NBA. I'm going to try to get in the UFC. When does that like, man, like last week. (laughs) (laughs) So Uh, fights in and you're like, and you still, it's still not a reality. After I fought Barbarina, I'm like, all right, this is my idea. No, uh, and I was, I was, I was a good amateur, really, you know what I mean? Like I was, I was, the guy was 16 and, or 12 and four as an amateur. Like I was, I was, I was a really good amateur. I progressed a lot when I was going, coming up in the amateur ranks and, and I got a lot of uh, following because of that. And I think that really just, you know what I mean? I was, 
I was a pretty good amateur. So, so that really kind of just said, Hey, this is, this is uh, something I can do. And I, I love doing it. It wasn't really like, Oh, I want to get to the UFC. This is what I want to do. This, this is my goal. It's like, I just, this is what I want to do. This is what I enjoy doing. Like, you know what I mean, I always wanted to be in the UFC cause that was the goal, but like, it was, it was just about training, having fun. You're 21 or you started when you were 21, you're 34, 13 years. How, what's the longest you've taken off without training? Oh, without training? Uh, like uh, two weeks, maybe. And, and what caused that? Why, why two weeks? Was there, did something happen? Uh, there what... Or something like that. There was, there was one point where my body was pretty beat up and just like not functioning correctly. And I just needed a couple of days off. And uh, yeah, I think I popped my hamstring last year before one of my fights. And I just took like a day or two off and just iced most of it. But yeah, I don't take much time off. Today's my first day back in training. I'll, I'll go and train. I took this week off. Still went to watch practices but i just i don't i enjoy being in training i don't like the fact that if i'm out of training i know my training partner is getting better than i am um we were watching the fights at my house the other night and all the parents from my a bunch of the parents from my kids uh gym were here i'm the only one who doesn't train i'm the bad dad all the other dads train with their kids and take the classes and and one of the dads who spends a lot of time with his kids like I do with mine, he basically – and he used to play the guitar and he had all these other you know outlets. And he basically said he loves jiu-jitsu because it allows him to express himself sort of like as an artist. It keeps him physically fit and he gets to do something with his kids. It's just like crazy efficient. Yeah. And, and I'm guessing it's like that for you too. It's just crazy efficient. It checks all the boxes, right? And now for you, it's a, it's a vocation. You, it's going to put food on your table. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, it's it, that's a, it's a great way to put it, about it that way. But uh, yeah, I mean, I got it, it plays into the gym that I own. It's not a mixed martial arts gym, but you know, people want strength conditioning. I, I'm I'm good at that stuff. It, it plays into to staying healthy. It plays, and I think I I know like when I was a kid, I wish I would have wrestled. I wish I would have done. I wish you know, if I was three years old, I wish I would have done that. And so when I have kids, I know that I will be putting those kids into it. And I think that the growth that I've seen from even being 22 to now, the growth I've seen, my kids will have that confidence and the things that I didn't have when I was younger to, to, uh, to have that when they're growing up, which I think is fantastic. And I think that's, that's something I really look forward to is having kids is, is kind of teaching them the things that, that I didn't know when I was younger. Yeah, when my um, six-year-old, uh, after two and a half years, he got his gray belt. He got all the stripes on his white belt, and then he got his gray belt. And I just went there, and then he took the gray belt test, and I just thought it was like, you know, I'm just sitting there watching. And then one of the instructors said to me, he w after class, walks by me, and he goes, well, no, that's it. And I go, what do you mean? He goes, he'll never be a white belt again. I go, what do you mean? He goes, even if he quits today and comes back in the gym in five years, he'll always be a gray belt. And I had to like hold back tears because I was like, holy shit, this kid at six, year old, six years old has earned something. I didn't think I earned something until I was 16 and it was a paycheck like you were saying. And I probably bought like alcohol with it. Oh. And I'm like, oh. it was crazy. It, 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 he has an identity at six years old. I mean, what a great thing to give a kid, right? What's, uh, what's stopping you from doing jiu Uh, I don't know the real reason, but I just tell myself that I don't want to get hurt. But I don't know the real reason. But I got a pretty tweaky back. Like I wake up every morning and the first hour is like really, really slow. But then, you know, I'll go in the garage and do it and, and get at it with CrossFit, you know. So who sounds, knows? Sounds like it's <laughs> Yeah, it probably is. It probably is. Um, 48 hours notice for your first fight. And it, it, it almost feels like 24 hours notice when you start hearing the story and like hearing all the shit you had to do to get ready. Um, can you walk me through the gritty details of that, where you were, who calls you, do you have an agent, do you have a manager? Like, how, like I, just hearing that you went on to take a fight in 48 hours stresses me the fuck out. Uh, super stressful. Very, very stressful. <laughs> uh, so I was at my gym. Uh, I had just gotten my rogue uh, squat rack like the one that mounts on the wall, the big ass 20 foot long one. I just got, I've been waiting for months for it to come in. I just got it delivered. Uh, I was eating Chipotle with one of my clients. I had six hours with the clients after that. Um, and, and I was eating a bag of chips and I look at my phone. I have my phone off the side. 
look at my phone and I have like four text messages from Joe Wooster and I have like four or five text messages from uh, Jason House and a couple phone calls. Uh, both Wait, those- Jason, Jason House is your agent? Yeah, yeah. The Iridium is my, my man. That's awesome. They do. They do a fantastic job. I, I'm all about them. So I called them back and my coach says, drop everything. What are you doing? I was like, I was like, just working. He's like, drop everything, cancel everybody. I don't care what you're doing. You have to get to the airport. This is 1245. You have to get to the airport for a three o'clock flight. Also, you have blood work to do. We already set that up. So I called my wife. I said, pack me a suitcase. We're in the dryer. Just throw it in the suitcase. I grab it. Run out the house. I live about 10 minutes away from my house. Ran out the house. Got all the way up north. Blood work. Blood work done. Ran to the airport. Made it to the airport by 210 for a three o'clock flight. So What's the blood work for, Jason? Uh... You have to get blood work done for, no matter what for your fighting for, you know, AIDS, uh, all, all that stuff, Hep C, everything. Just to make sure you're, you don't have any of that stuff for the fighting. Does it check for also for like steroids or COVID or is it just like everything? Uh, I'm not 100% sure. I only get tests for steroids. It could, but I'm not. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, so anyways, I made a, I made a, I got a call at 1245, made it to the airport by 210. I live an hour from the airport. 45 minutes away from the airport. So, so I'm, I'm hauling ass on the highway, right? Call, hey, I'm fighting. This is shit's crazy. Which in reality, I didn't even know. I didn't even have a fight. I was just, a, I was just a backup just in case. Um, so I get there and I had to weigh in the next day at nine o'clock. I get to the, I get to the hotel about six 45, seven o'clock, start cutting weight. I cut 13 pounds, make it to weigh ins by nine o'clock or made the weigh ins by nine o'clock the next day. Weigh in, get all that stuff done. They say, hey, your blood work didn't come in right. You got to go do it again. So I had to go and do blood work again. Um, this is after I just made weight. So I did all that stuff. And then I, then my coach like, hey, man, you got the fight. That's great. We actually have a fight. I'm like, okay, that's awesome. I thought I already had a fight. So it wasn't really news to me, but apparently I had a fight. Um, and so wake up the next day, fight day, eat like normal, uh, get to the venue. They say, hey, your blood work's not done. Rush to the hospital, get blood work done again, which you're not. A third time? A third time? I was oh, already stressed out. I was already in my up and everything on. Um, my hands weren't wrapped just yet. But yeah, which you're not supposed to do it is what it is. So that's why I got moved back to the main card. Uh, and my blood work did not get back until the I walked out for the fight. Like they opened the door and said, hey, Blood works good. You're ready to go. Also, your fight's up next. Let's go. And Holy shit. Stressful, longest. Uh, it was the most exciting weekend of my life, but also most stressful. But it opened a lot of doors for me. It gave me a four fight contract, got me the UFC, uh, got me paid. So, I'm, you know, I'm really, I couldn't be upset about it. I'm looking back at it. I really wouldn't change the way it happened. Who's J- who's Jason? Uh, who's Rooster? Who, what was the first guy's name? Who? Joe Wooster. He's, Joe Wooster. Uh, been my manager since like 2013 2014 uh he partnered with iridium so they're both my management team i i um wh- when i wanted to start interviewing ufc fighters because i watched so much ufc i was i don't know i'm trying to remember how i came across jason house but i came across him and i thought oh i should interview this guy and then hopefully if he likes me he'll start introducing he'll let me start interviewing a bunch of his fighters and so I've been trying to schedule with him, and we keep missing. We keep missing. But I think he's on the schedule for next week. He's a, Say busy, that again. He's a busy dude. I bet. And so in these interviews that he kept doing, every once in a while I would hear him mention this prospect he had, Mo Miller. Don't know. Okay. So he's not in the UFC yet. I think he's fighting in the Contender Series in September. And, um, so, um, I interviewed, I interviewed Mo and it was awesome. It was, it was, it was we, we had a blast, but it's, so it's crazy. And then I had heard, um, that it's Iridium, right? Jason house Iridium. I basically heard that he has more MMA fighters than pretty much anyone out there. And so it's kind of, but I didn't know you were with him. I think they have like 150 people on the roster. Yeah. That's crazy. I'm stupid. How, how do you choose an agent? So. When I part of the glory in my fitness where I'm at now, uh, Joe Wooster was just a part of that. And Joe Wooster, I'd known Joe, Joe for a long time. as an amateur days. Um, so, like, just the whole – the Kansas City area, MMA scene, is, it's a small, small scene. Everybody knows everybody. Uh, you know people from St. Louis. You know people from Colorado. 
from Iowa, Nebraska, all that stuff. So like everybody knows everybody, and 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 Wooster just. Uh, I mean, I've known him for a long time. I fought on his couple of his shows that he had. Uh, my last amateur fight was on his show, um, and so I just it was just kind of an easy easy decision. Like, hey, I need a manager. That's where it works. So so you jump in the ring with this guy um, with just a few hours, you know, two days notice. It's a whirlwind. Um, and w- what was his name again? Ta- Tato? Tato? Uh, Santo. Santo. Sorry, Santo. No offense. I'm bad with names. And um, have you done any research on him? Had you heard about him before? Did you know if he was a ground guy, a stand-up guy? What did, what did you know? He was a stand-up guy, but he had a good left hand, which obviously he does because, you know, I just – I ate it. Um, yeah, I mean, you, there's not a lot of research you can do. There's not a lot of game plan you have in there. Uh, so we, we knew going into it what he wanted, and I just I recognized it quick enough and it ended, uh, ended my night real quick. When you lose a fight, um, do you, is there a goal to avenge it, or do you just let it go? Uh, you got to have a short memory in this game. You know, I mean, my coach is telling me all the time, and so – I don't want to say that with the 48 hour notice fight, I kind of just let it go. Cause I really, I really didn't. Um, obviously I came back way better. And with the full camp, I was a different monster. And that's, that was obviously apparent in the Cole Williams fight. Um, you gotta have a short man. If, if you dwell on stuff like that, you're just going to sit there and, and, you know, sit there and sulk in your misery. No point in doing that. In this game, you gotta get better. And the only way to do that is get back in the gym and work. Does your wife stress out about your fighting about other dudes punching her, her her gem in the face first off i don't know if i'm her gem <laughs> i bet uh, it, the pictures sure make it look like she loves you a lot <laughs> instagram versus reality no i'm just kidding uh no she does uh yeah she stressed out a lot she drinks a lot before the before the fight happens mom both do um yeah she's super stressed about it but you know she also sees the amount of work that i put in each each and every day i come home exhausted i'm an asshole she knows, she knows what I put in. So she, she kind of, I mean, understands that, Hey, this is what I'm doing. This is, and I told her since, since that first day we started dating, look, this is what I do. And if you don't like that, there's a door. And I've told that with every girl I've ever dated. If you, if you don't like fighting, if you want to tell me not to go to training, we're not going to work. So there's a curb. How, how about your parents? Like I have, a, I have a, I have three kids, like I said, and like my kids are my crown jewels. You know, they're my Sistine chapel. They're my greatest they're my thinker. They're like, they're my greatest piece of work. They're the only thing that I'm, I've ever put all 100% of my passion into creating. Right. Okay. Um, and, and now they've, your parents have obviously created this amazing human being. He's 34 years old. He's an incredible physical specimen. He's smart. He's married. And now their specimen is going out. Does this, do they just push down their fears? Do they just push them all away and not talk? I, I was thinking if my kid got into fighting, I, I would probably I wouldn't express how I felt about it to him. Do you know what I mean? I would just push it down because you want your kid to be happy. That's first and foremost. Uh, my mom, man, my mom hates fighting with the passion. She, that's, I'll tell you this story. Tell you the story. When I was when I first started, I lived with my parents. She goes, look, if you start fighting. Or you get a tattoo, I will keep my house. Yo, I don't got a tattoo, but I got a fight next week. Uh, and she came to the fight. She was hammered drunk. She stood in the front row and hated it with every bit of it. I lost that fight. Um, and she really disliked it. She hates it with a passion still to this day. She she, But she came into the gym one day and saw me hitting pads with my one of my coaches back then. And just saw how much I loved doing it. Just noticed that it, I wasn't just fighting people all the time. We weren't just busting heads we were hitting pads i was trying to get better we and she really like she really supported me probably my biggest fan shares everything does you know, i mean all that stuff um but i said earlier talking about my mom smoking cigarettes and we had a, I, I went to breakfast with her yesterday took her and my dad out to dad out to breakfast yesterday my wife and uh we got into the whole argument about smoking cigarettes and i we got an argument she's like to like, how much I hate fighting, right? I'm like, yeah. She goes, well, that's how you feel about me smoking cigarettes. I'm like, how many people have died from MMA? None. How many people have died from smoking cigarettes? A lot. So your argument is invalid in that in that stance. But I said, okay. I said, I said when I quit fighting, which I'm not gonna fight forever because I don't fucking want to. I don't want to get punched in the face forever. When I quit fighting, you have to quit smoking cigarettes. We shook on it. So 
you know, a couple years down the road right now, she asked to quit smoking cigarettes. So at least, at least I got that, that, uh, timeline out of it. it it's, it's interesting. Training is beautiful. Like fight training is, is beautiful. So it's, it's basically like going to a ballet. You know what I mean? Like you see the guys rolling around, you see the guys hitting the mitts, you see the guys sidestepping, taking angles, you know, like, like in some of the greats that you watch train, like Lomachenko. I don't know if you're into, do you watch boxing? I love Lomachenko. That's a gangster. Yeah, or Chocolatito, or you see these guys and they move, and it's just like in the training, it's beautiful. And then, yeah, I could see where if you're the you're the parent, you don't want your kid taking his ballet out to the world, like because then in that game, like I mean, it, it's it's got to be hard, especially like your fight with um, Cole Williams. There's so much fucking blood. Yeah, but it was his blood, so I know you're. <laughs> Tell me about that. Is that the first, what was the first fight you ever had where there was just a ton of blood and, and were you shocked at all? Or are you just, do you have time to reflect on it in the moment? Like you're like, holy shit, this is all over me. This is in my eyes. I can't get around. I, I, this is slippery. Like most human beings don't know what it's like to have, th like I have no idea what that much blood feels like. I just know the commentators say it's really gets really slippery. Yeah, that that's, that's my goal, man. I love putting Xbox logos on people's foreheads. Um, no, I mean, once I busted him open, he was bleeding. It's not even a second thought to me. It just doesn't doesn't register. I love it. I think it's fantastic. I'm not gonna be BJ Penn licking blood off my gloves, but at the same time, it, it, you don't you just don't think about it. You're in there for a reason. I'm, my focus is just to beat him, and that's if I gotta put crosses on his forehead, then I'm okay with that. Right. It's part of, it's part of the process. You know things are going well, or you, it's, it's part of the evolution of the fight. If you see blood, okay, like we're in this stage in the fight. It also shows that I'm winning the fight if his face is all blood. In the the two fights you lost the in the UFC, the punches that you took there did not look as hard as the punches you took from Barbarina. And I wonder if it's because it takes the face a while to warm up and get used to a punch. Because you guys were fucking dropping bombs on each other. I mean, that one was that was a crazy fight. Yeah. So a lot of that has to do with. Uh, I think that a lot of that's to do with hydration and rehydration from the weight cut. So obviously the first fight, I wasn't the first fight I cut on, you know, 13 pounds, 12 hours notice. Um, so I don't think I rehydrated well enough. I, I didn't, I didn't have time to, um, the Semmelsberger fight. I was, we, after that fight, we went to the Institute and ran a bunch of tests that kind of showed me, Hey, pretty much what they told me is I'm the most stressed athlete the UFC has recorded. I need to do something to change my life. So I needed more sleep, which... What do you mean? They did, like, diagnostics on you, and they're like, hey, some, like your system is stressed? What it, like, yeah. Give me an idea what that looks like. What tests do they do? They ran, they ran, like, body mass tests and stuff like that, which just kind of shows where my body weight is and that. But they gave me, like, uh, a questionnaire that kind of shows me, hey, this, where's your body feel at this point? Where do you, like... There's almost kind of opinion-based on depending on how I feel, but at the time, like, I know, like, I felt terrible in the world. In, in terms of their questionnaire, they're like, hey man, something's fucked up. You got to change something, or you're you're just you're gonna die. Which, which I knew something was messed up, but it, I'm I'm a prideful person. I guess I just didn't reach out to say. I just I thought that as an entrepreneur, I was waking up at 4 a.m. I'd run my classes, I'd go to training, I'd come back, I'd run I'd run more classes, then I'd go back to training, and then either I go back to work or I go home. And so I wouldn't get enough sleep. I was getting like six hours, maybe five hours, and I'm twice a day six, seven, eight clients a day, just was running my body, body down to the ground. And, uh, and so you show up on fight week with your body being that stressed, my body was 190 and I couldn't get under that. My body was just not having it. So I cut 15 pounds of water, five pounds of soda. So I really essentially cut 20 pounds. And I really think that hydration factor, your brain can't get hydrated enough. Your jaw can't get hydrated enough. Your body's just not hydrated. You don't feel good. And I knew I didn't feel good. And so when I ate that punch, which I'm not taking away from Simmelsburg, he hit me clean that you know, he won that fight fair and square. But I know that that Barbara hit me way harder. It's, it's just, I think that, that hydration plays into the whole factor. And you can obviously see the, the difference of when I am getting sleep and my body is a full camp and I am, I am rehydrated. A punch I can take, you know, I mean, the, how good I am in the cage between Simmelsburg and Barbara for sure. Uh, I'm not just saying this because um, Jason Witt is here. If you guys want to see a remarkable fight, go to ESPN Plus and watch his fight with Barbarina. You will not be disappointed. Um, it is. It's, month. Yeah. Say that again. It was fight of the month. 
uh, it was they're calling it round of the year because that third round was just so crazy. Insane. And you and you won you you won fight of the night, right? I did, yeah. Yeah, that it's a crazy fight. And uh, um and you answered a lot of questions too. Anyone who just thought you were a wrestler, um, now whoever fights you next has to definitely be concerned because I don't think a lot of people would have taken some of those punches you gave Barbarena if he wasn't made of stone. I don't, I don't think a lot of people would. And I was you know what? I thought the third round was gonna be the entire fight because I know how Barbarena fights. Um, but I'm not just a wrestler and I don't, I don't, I know that my two fights are just from wrestling and it shows, but like, uh, I'm a, I'm a well-rounded fighter. I think, I think a lot of people, if I would have, Barbarina is hard to knock down. There's not a lot of people have beat him or knocked him down, the, you know, like that. And I didn't expect to, uh, especially multiple times. So yeah, I think anybody else, um, they're going to go to sleep. Is it, um, what is, what is that feeling like when you, I mean, I don't, I, I guess I haven't asked you this question yet, but it looked like you fucking punched him pretty much as hard as you could with a perfect punch. And once, and it looks like he also hit you as hard as he can in the face with a perfect punch and the other person doesn't go down. Do you, do you even process that for a second or do you just start punching? Or are you like, Holy shit, how is he still standing? Or do you ever ask yourself, Holy shit, how am I still standing? No, man, when you're not fighting your folks, just, just the, the task at hand, you're ready there to fight. Uh, if I was down, that's great. I really didn't expect it. So that, that was kind of a shock factor. Uh, I expect him to hit my wife with that fight. Look, I'm going to be bloody. I'm going to have blood on my face. This is not going to be an easy fight. I thought round one would be hard. I thought round two would be a little more, he'd put a little more pressure. And I thought round three was going to be round three the way it was. But, uh, round one and two, I I really felt good. And I didn't think my wrestling was going to be that dumb against him. And that really played a huge factor in the fight. But, uh, yeah, you don't think about getting hit in the hitting that time. You're you're in there to, for one task, and that's that's meet the guy, and that's that's all you think about. When you fight someone like that, do you think, holy shit, this guy's fought in some of the fucking greatest in the sport and some legends, and now I got to deal with this fucking dude, or is it? Yeah, I, I mean that that plays a factor in my head. That really does. Like he, he fought Luke, he fought Colby Covington, he fought a lot of big names. Leon Edwards fought a lot of big names. Um. But you really – you can't think that way. If I think that way, I'm going in there to lose. And I really think the UFC, if you're my honest opinion, set it up. You know, I was on my last contract. I was on my last fight. Uh, Barbarina was a huge, huge uh, favorite in that fight. And I really think that they were trying to get Barbarina back on a win streak, which is, which is fine. I mean, he's, he's a veteran in the sport. He's been in the UFC for a while. He has 12 fights in the UFC. He's, he's, a, he's a nice guy, and he's, he's a great fighter. But I really think that they were kind of looking at it that way. And didn't expect uh, me to come out the way I did, but I did. Yeah, um, I didn't look until last night. I started looking around at what the pundits were saying, and yeah, you were an enormous underdog. I didn't know that when I sat down to watch the fight that night, but you you were an enormous underdog. And so yeah. it's, it's it's kind of great. You were basically the Rocky who fought, you know, in, in, on a smaller scale, but the Rocky who fought, uh, you know, Apollo and won. Uh, yeah, kind. Of, I mean, kind of, sort of. Did you know, did you, are you scared when you go into a fight like that? Is it in your head that like, oh shit, if I lose this, my, my I'm, I'm four and done in the UFC. Like basically they're not going to resign me. Yeah, it definitely, it definitely was in the back of my head. I knew that was, and, and that was I'll set fight. That's my retirement fight. That's, that's, I'm, I'm done. I'm not going back to the lower levels. I'm, I mean, like, like I'm getting up there in age and I don't want to fight forever. Um, and so that was kind of be like my deciding factor. Like I'm probably done. So that played a factor in the back of my head, but, at the same time, my I'm, I might be one of those people that it it, it helped out you know, when there and win that fight. Um. So how long? A- and, and we're just speculating. We don't know for sure if they would have cut you. But l- how long after do you get a call and they're saying, "Hey, we want to sign you up for uh, four more fights or however many they signed you up for"? Uh, I talked to James Krause. I was I had made, I had to go sit. So when I lost the fight against Simmelsberger, I had to go sit back with the doctor for 30, 45 minutes. When I won the fight, I had to go sit back with the doctors for 34. That was okay. Um, but, yeah, Kraut told me by that time, and this is 20 minutes after the fight. 20 minutes after? Sorry, you broke up a little bit. Holy shit, that's awesome. Wow. So you win the fight, you get fight of the night, and you get another contract. Yeah, it was a great fucking night. <laughs> and is your wife there in the building? No, she was at home. They, uh, with the Apex, they keep, they don't have really a lot of fans, and it's fight week. I don't want my I don't want my wife uh, hanging around. It's not my style. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't blame you. So no family there, just just your um, gym family. 
just Kraus, Jason High, and uh, Julian Marquez. Wow. Um, I noticed you retired a pair of your lifting shoes. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so tell me about your lifting. Like, what what are your are, are you like a back squatter, deadlifter? Uh, what what are your lifts? What what's your like go to bread and butter that you do? Uh, man, I'm a deadlifter. I love deadlifts. Uh, I didn't lift a lot for this fight because my body was just it was, it was taking a lot of stress, and the less I lifted, the better I felt, and the better I did. So, um, but yeah, I love deadlifting. Uh, when I was probably about 21, 22, I I, I didn't know how to deadlift, and so I just taught myself how to deadlift and get better and better. Like three days a week, just I didn't, you know, at that point, you don't know any better, so you just you're just working. Um, I love deadlift, I, I got my deadlift up to quite a bit. Um, I think, I think my max was like for one was like 585. Holy shit, my five by five was 505, and my my one by 10 was 425, something like that. So, so something I really enjoy doing. I love that, I love being strong. I like, I like picking up heavy ass weights and putting them down. And, and how about back squatting? Do you have a good back squat and a good front squat? Uh, I have a decent back squat. Um, I want to say right now I'd like it to be, but I think my max is around 450. Uh, somewhere on my front squat, I PR'd by accident one day. Uh, I was at a police academy. And, uh, <laughs> I was at a police academy, and I didn't realize they had 100-pound uh, plates instead of 45-pound plates. And I put those on by accident, and uh, – I PR'd my back squat by 30 pounds. I one rep, like I picked it up and I was like, man, I just want to feel weak. One rep out of it. And then I really counted. And I was like, oh shit. Like, it was like 330, somewhere around there for a front squat. So, what were you doing at the police academy? Uh, I have a couple friends. Uh, the girl I was dating, her dad was a police officer. And then I have a couple friends who were in the police, police academy too. Um, going back to the sleep thing, and and this, it's, I don't think people realize. So you're at the top of the game. You're in the UFC. You're running a fucking business. You have, like, you have, you, you said the day that you went to go fight, you had to cancel six clients, right? You had six hours of personal training. Yeah. And basically, you had to run yourself ragged to get to where you were at. And obviously, it was your passion and you loved it. So ragged might not be the right word. But then in order to stay there, you had to give some of that up. Can you talk to me about that and tell me how much you're sleeping now, what what you had to give up to sort of, if you're going to stay in the UFC? So really, I didn't, I didn't give up a lot, honestly. Um, I have a, I had a 5 a.m. and a 6 a.m. boot camp Monday, Wednesday, Friday that, that I love those classes. They're great people. I've had them for a long time, uh, probably about three or four years. Um, and so instead of – and I'd wake up four – classes so instead of instead of canceling those classes i hired somebody to run my classes i get up at six now six six thirty i run i have a seven o'clock o'clock and i go to training so i'm sleeping like at least eight hours now seven to eight hours seven to nine hours somewhere around there so that really just played a bigger factor instead of waking up four wake up at you know six or six or seven and you know people who get up at 8 30 are like listening to you right now going what the fuck Instead of getting up at four, you've cut back and get up at six thirty. What did you say? Sorry, you broke up. I'm listening to myself going with the fuck. <laughs> I worked. I worked for an ice company for like, up at five a.m. <clears throat> truck, and I deliver ice on the back of a truck. Then I go to training, and I mean I've done this shit for. It's, it's not anything for me. I just I'm a worker. Like I'm a workhorse. That's just the way I am. You know what I mean? There's there's probably smarter, better ways to do it, but I'm not the brightest crown in the box. So I just I just work my ass off until I get what I need. Does does um does delivering ice make you strong? But I would say so. I was pulling one ton stores and throwing twenty pound bags of ice off the back of a truck, you know, multiple, multiple, multiple times a day. I'm looking down at my notes. Oh, this was a fun one. I liked your expression when the judge said in the Barbarana fight twenty eight twenty eight. That was crazy. Fuck off. Where, where, that was crazy. Please, you guys, watch the fight and watch. I'd like to see if your reaction is the same as mine and Jason's. How, um, do you, do you know the judges? Do you meet the judges? Do you make eye contact with the judges? Do the fighter, like, tell me about judges. Where are they? They're just sitting right at the side of the ring? Uh, yeah, all three sides of the ring. I don't. All three sides? There's one on each side? Yeah, there's three judges. So there's. You know, they're, they're pretty much a triangle around the gym. Around okay. The gym. I thought I just pictured them all together sitting in the same on the same bench. No, I don't think so. Honestly, okay. Um, don't. 
I mean, you know, it, it, they are what they are. They serve a purpose. But to give that to give that fight a 28-28, you're out of your fucking mind. Even give him a 10-8 round in the third round, which he dropped me twice. I dropped him twice. I took him down. Yeah, it was a crazy fight, but there's no way it's a 10-8 round. You give him a 10-8 round in that in round three, how do you not give me a 10-8 round in round three? I dropped him twice and took him down multiple times and dominated that. Like, how do you not? So... 28 and one of the judges eyes you're you're a fucking idiot in my opinion but and it it was the first in my opinion too it was crazy it was it was obvious you won i mean he, barbarina did great but it was obvious you won to everyone at home no one was like at home was like oh it's a draw or barbarina won i can't imagine but um when that was the first score that was given out you guys are out there Does, do you start tripping are you like oh fuck did i did i not perceive this right no, there's just there's no there's no. I knew at the end of that fight, and Kraus even said it mid mid middle of round two and three. He's like, "Look, we're up two rounds. Just don't get finished." I'm like, first off, that's the worst thing to tell me, not to get finished, because now I'm thinking about to get finished." Uh, but no, like, I knew I had one and two, and if and there's no way anybody, you know what I mean, I think I had him. I controlled him for five straight minutes, or five. I had control time of five minutes. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's no way I didn't have one and two in the bag. So I don't see how, you know, round three was, I don't know how you get a draw. So when they, when they said 28, 28, I was like, that's bullshit. And then I knew, I just knew in my head that I won the fight. There's, there's no denying it. If I'm round three, I win. Um, have you gone back and watched that fight? Just like one or 12 times. One or 12. Yeah, it's good. Um, and, uh, do you go back and watch all your fights? If I win, yeah. Um, do you, when you watch the Barbarina fight and, and, and you see him punching you, do you, do you, do you talk to yourself? Like, are you like, Jason, you fucking idiot. You should have moved to the side there or, Oh, that was a great punch Barbarina. Or like, what's the dialogue like in your head when you're watching the fight? So, I mean, you're always the, I'm not great at watching fights. I, I always watch from a fighter or a fan's perspective and it's hard for me, but I got guys at the gym, like Grant Dalton, mastermind of watching fights. James Krause who's really good at watching fights. Um, they all they, they watch a fight from a fan's perspective and they watch it from a fighter's perspective and they watch it from a coach's perspective and they watch it of like, if I was fighting this guy, how would I beat me and how would I beat him? So they, they watch it multiple times in different ways, which is crazy to me. It's hard for me to do that, but I do, I've gotten a little bit better at doing that um, in terms of like, I'll watch as a fan and then I'll watch it as to do better. Um, and then I'll watch it as like, okay, this is what I work on this, what I need to fix. Um, and I mean, the goal after a fight is just to, it's to get better. You win the fight, that's a test. That's a test. Now, you get better for next one. I, I was watching an interview with uh, Vicente Luque, Luca uh, after his fight with uh, Pieza. P- I can't even say their names, but after that fight. Um, and he said that when he heard the crowd booing, it like affected him because he wants to put on a show. And as a fan personally, I never want the fighters to be affected by the booing. Like, I don't care if the two guys, like the Derek Lewis, um, Ningano first fight, I didn't care that they didn't punch each other. I mean, of course I want to see it, but it's like, it's not me in the fucking ring. Like I understand what's going on. They're both fucking terrified. Like, or at least that's what I think. And like, I'm not like thinking, Hey assholes, I want my money back. I'm thinking, Holy shit. I can't believe you guys got in the ring with each other and locked the door. Yeah two massive huge power strikers i'm not no nobody's from them and, and start swinging it's a terrible idea um but yeah i mean so in between round two and three Kraus said hey man i don't care if this is the most boring fight of your life like just don't fucking get finished and and there's been a lot of times especially with barbarina when we were fighting for the when we were in camp they're like look i don't care if it's a boring fight like if we can stay away from his power then why would we not you know what i mean if we can time our takedowns better and, and stay away from his power then if the crowd's booing, I don't care if it's if it's a boring ass fight. We're winning. Winning is the goal is to win. The goal is not, you know, what I mean, I'm an entertainer regardless. The goal is not to like please the fans. The goal is to win and get three paid. That's what I'm looking. For. If I mean, if the fight, if fans don't like that part, then y'all can fight. Then you can, you can fight Brian Barberina. I don't give a shit. Fuck yeah. And I always try to compare it to other sports too. Like if you're a boxing fan and you switch to MMA and do both, boxing is so slow compared to MMA. Or let's say you're a baseball fan. Are you fucking kidding me? You go five innings without something happening. <laughs> I mean, so relative, when I hear the fans booing or giving the fighter shit, I'm like, are you fucking crazy? Like at any second, something horrible can happen. Just chill. Just hang right. out. So you're not, you're, you're not affected by that at all. 
No, not at all. I mean, I also I also haven't fought in front of fans in the UFC either. So I mean, that can be played. In, but I fought in front of you know five thousand people before, and, and you you kind of play off when you slam somebody, they they scream and yell. So I never had anybody booing a fight. I I think I'm a pretty exciting fighter, but so is Lucas. So what they're booing for, but and I don't I y'all y'all are not aren't in here, so you can't tell me what to do because you're not the one fighting. You've never fought in front of fan- all of your UFC fights have been in the Apex with no fans. This is one that had, had 150 fans, so a little bit of fans there, but that was about it. Is that weird? Is that like it? it is that like being in a, it? Feels more like a street fight. Like holy shit! Like you can hear everything. No, it's awesome. It's like it's it, like Ross is playing a video game. He just tells me what to do, and I do it. It's awesome. Fantastic. Oh really? Tell me about that. So literally, it's like that. Like he'll tell you kick, and you kick, and 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 it lands, and you're like, holy shit! Keep t- keep feeding me. Yeah, a lot of times I'm already doing it, or he's said it, and it's we do it simultaneously. But there's a lot of times like when I have him against cage, he'll say do this, do this, and I'll do it, and it'll work. And then he's like, go from here. And James Cross is the best coach, like like the best cornerman there ever was, because he is very, very specific on what to do. And a lot of a lot of people are just like, go one two. James Cross is very specific on how to how to win the fight, and 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 so like when you're in the apex, you can hear him say, "Okay, do this, reap, do this, da da da," and you're like, "Okay, it's like it's like playing a video game." And 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 but the guy you're fighting can hear him giving telling you what to do too, right? I mean, obviously, that's fine. It's his job to stop it. And you can hear what his coach is saying. Yeah, I'm more focused on my coaches, but you can you can definitely hear what they're saying too. And can you hear the commentators? Uh, I hear the comments. Sometimes you can, but not really. They're not loud enough. Is there anything that's distracting in there besides the fighter, or no? You just lock in, and it's you and James Krause. The ring girls. <laughs> the ring girls are pretty crazy. Damn, no. UFC did a great job with the ring girls. They're so <laughs> they're so like you go back to boxing, and it's just it's um it's just such a different vibe from the ring girls. The ring girls for the UFC are great. Uh, man, there's really nothing distracting in there. It's it's when you're in there, you're at that higher level of focus. All you hear is your coaches, the three coaches in your corner, and the the smash of leather. Do you have a choice to do the press conference afterwards? I've, I've been looking for the press conference with Derek Lewis after his fight with uh, Surreal, and I can't find it. So I'm guessing that you don't have to do them. Usually, if you lose the fight, you don't get to do the press conference. Oh, you don't get to do it. Not nothing more. I don't know about the main event. I don't know how that works, but the fights that I've lost, you do not do pressers. You do not do photos. You don't do any of that stuff. But if you win the fight, then you get to do all the press. And do you look forward to doing that? I do. I've really kind of embraced it and enjoyed doing it. Like like I told you earlier, the interviews I used to get nervous at, and I talked too fast and didn't know what to say. And now that I've done quite a few of them, and I quit, I like the press conference. I like talking to people. I like just kind of hyping things up a little bit. I don't mean like in a shit talking way. I don't talk crap. I just enjoy talking to people. Yeah, it's kind of like your parade. The press conference is your parade. Which is weird because I don't like talking to people in real life. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for doing this. Um, <laughs> do you know your um do you know your next fight? Uh nope, not yet. Um how how will you know? What 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 will the process be? When will will someone just call you again and be like, hey, you have forty eight hours? No, 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 no. They'll give me there now that I have a contract me like twelve weeks, fourteen weeks, but so my coach put me off the side and said, Hey, doing fight. I never said no. So I'm uh, like, hey, we're fighting this person this day. Like, cool. And um, do you think you'll fight this year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to get another fight in within this year at least. My birthday is November, so I'm trying to fight around that time. Wow. Uh, as a birthday present to yourself, punch someone in the face. I'm bad present. <laughs> um, Jason, uh, I've taken an hour and four minutes of your time. I would uh, love to do it again sometime. I'd love to talk about your next fight when you get it signed up. For sure. You gave us a, you gave us a lot of details. You answered a lot of my personal questions, and I really, really appreciate this. And uh, I hope it didn't fuck your back up sitting in a car for an hour. No, I mean, I got heated seats. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> You have your car running? I do, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what kind of car? Do you, and it's a brand new car. Uh, it is a brand new car. Yeah, so uh, my wife, uh, her family owns car dealerships. So when we got married, I get a dealer car every 
four thousand miles every so often and see a new car. That's awesome because I see I'm I'm I see the sticker in the back on the back of the window. Yeah, so but Our, I got Subarus. So I get a Subaru every couple thousand miles and just trade that in. Awesome. All right, brother. Thank you very much. Of course.